Hello everyone, welcome back. This is chapter 11 lecture. We're getting close to the end of the semester. I know it's been tough for a lot of folks doing the online format. And to be honest, this is my first time doing the seven week format and it went quicker than I had planned. We, I know that we missed an assignment that I had planned called a cultural plunge. Don't worry about that. We won't obviously calculate that into the grades. And also, I'm, I need to get caught up on some grading. So if you have entries that you know you turned in that is not graded, it's not saying that you didn't turn it in. It's just simply saying that I did not get a chance to grade it as of yet. And then also, I know there was a, a, a few people that had some challenges trying to figure out what group they were in. Go to the actual final assignment and there is a link there that tells you what group you're in. Don't look at the other groups that's not connected to the assignments. That's going to confuse you. So just wanted to add those things as we go forward with Chapter 11. So here we come to common rebuttals. You should be doing the readings and keeping up with everything. There will be a quiz on these two chapters as well, as we have been customarily doing. But... There are, these are common rebuttals on that peep that we hear often that you and I might have said. So let's move forward. Teachers often believe that schools are politically neutral. And so the class is sex, uh, racism, sexism in educational institutions. Now, it is a gen ed class. And so I intentionally talk about race, class, and gender on a broader perspective. And it's not always rooted in education, my discourse. That's purposeful because this class is designed to get us to think about society, the world, yourself, the global picture. But here, I want to say a few things about schools. Teachers often believe that schools are politically neutral and that we must remain objective and not be biased. But it is impossible to teach a class without being without being subjective or a bias to a certain extent. You're going to favor something. If you have a particular worldview, you're going to favor that. So if you are leftward leaning, you're going to favor that. If you're rightward leaning, you're going to favor that. If you have been brought up in the middle class or the upper middle class, that is going to influence how you teach. That is going to influence your values. And so when we teach classes, for example, and we favor boys for math, that we're making a political choice. Or if we view African-American males as thugs in our classroom and we view them by looking at them and assume that they're going to start trouble because of experiences we have with other black folks, we're making political choices. Many argue that politics have no place in school. I argue that it's impossible to teach without being involved in politics. I'm not saying that you are outright endorsing a candidate or outright endorsing a political figure or political party, but even your values are political. Even the choices that we make when we downplay talking about African-American history, when we downplay talking about women's history or women's rights, we are making a political decision. How to respond? Well, education, as I just said, in and of itself is political. Schools cannot be neutral ground. School is not a neutral place. And so you see the caricature, the, the, the imagery I have there, freedom, equality, fairness, justice. These are components of school and they are also political. Schools are political. They have to educate students about the nation's social history. Good teaching does that. They provide a multitude of perspectives. Foster critical thinking and perspective taking. They enhance student stamina for engaging with challenging ideas. That's from page 131 in the text. Actually, it's not from, that's from the, it's 131 in the older edition. It's in chapter 11 in the new, newer edition that we have been using. Schools often struggle to help students understand the amount of conflict and struggle it took for freedom and, e and equality to be made. So school, a school's job can be to talk about the plight of immigrants, to talk about the struggles that they had, even as the Irish came over, or 
Irish Catholics or discrimination against anybody that was different and how African Americans were treated in this country, even as recent as the Civil Rights Movement and even in contemporary times with the various political challenges that's been happening in the communities of color. But often, as you know, the, the quote, real history is presented as European American history, the best history. So the more, most important stuff is the way we've been taught, at least. It's George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, Benedict Arnold, the Revolutionary War, where only the European perspective is presented, the Civil War, and not really talking about the role that African Americans played in that war, the role that Native Americans played. And it's not to say that European Europeans are bad people or that to talk about European history is not important. It's very important. But to present European history as the only history and the best history is disingenuous and it's intellectually dishonest. And it's, it's, it's morally dishonest. And it's inaccurate. And you're not being a very good teacher if you don't look at the whole picture. A more totalitarian, uh, 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 wholesome approach, holistic approach of history. Conversations about women's rights, civil rights, indigenous and disability, and other social topics are often left out. Sometimes intentionally because people don't feel that it's important. Schools can be sites where students can participate in a more social justice oriented education. And you see there, I have the declaration by the United Nations there to talk about human rights, just as a symbol of human rights. How can we talk about politics in schools? This video is a, a couple years old. It was done during the time of the Obama presidency, but it's still relevant because it shows how a social studies teacher got his students involved in politics and in, in looking at politics and knowing what's going on, particularly during the presidential debate of Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. It's good to look at in terms of uh, a good way to bring politics into the classroom in a objective, balanced way. Many people dismiss social justice scholarship as merely the radical, and even worse, the opinion of left, left, left-wing professors. I guess like myself, many people, rather than engaging it and rather than taking it seriously and rather than doing the homework and looking at the research and digging in and reading the books, the many, many hundreds, hundreds of thousands of books that have been written on this topic that are well-researched, using the scientific method, quantitative research, qualitative research, mixed method, historical method, there are, there are folks that designated their life to doing research and scientists, social scientists out there. And it's very, very narrow-minded to say, oh, these are, this is just someone's opinion. That really shows that that individual is not ed as educated as they should be. They just relegated to opinion because there are scholars at Harvard, Yale, all of the Ivy League respected institutions in the country that are doing this kind of work and, and this valid work. It is not opinion. It is research. That's why I ground everything in the text. Everything we talk about, I have you read the text. Your opinions are so strong. This is the comments that some people say. These ideas are so radical. That's probably true if you've never been exposed to it. This is one-sided. I wish you could include text from the other side of the conversation. Well, the other side of the conversation has always been had every single day, especially when you talk about history. Most of our history, most of our education that's being from a European perspective, as if that's the, the best history. And so most of the time, it, that's all that it's been talked about. It's the mainstream ideology. And so this class tries to actually balance the conversation. People reduce scholarship and critical social justice education to just an opinion. We talked about that and personal values. That's not true. People argue that critical classrooms only teach opinion and are non-objective. Well, objectivity is, is really important in terms of scientific research. I would not have been able to get a PhD if I was just giving my opinion. My doctor worked and held my feet to the fire. And we did quantitative work. That's looking at statistics and, and hard sciences, and social sciences as well. And then we did qualitative work, which is interview methods and trying to get an understanding of things. So Mo all of these scholars that we're talking about, including the, the scholars of our text, Senso and D'Angelo, are eminent scholars. 
They're well respected, respected in the higher education realm. So if you're saying that it's just opinion, you are miseducated and you need to read some more. So think about that. People position more neutral classes as real and preferred knowledge. So c classes that aren't controversial, people say this is real knowledge. Saying that this class is radical discredits the information and makes it subjective rather than factual. Subjective in your mind. So citing exceptions to the rule. So this is what I hear a lot. I used to say these things myself. Barack Obama was president, so racism ended in the U.S. That's a really limited understanding of the things that we've been talking about, systemic racism. It's very limited in understanding. He's just an exception, but look at how many other presidents have been black in the United States. So I want you to count that up. How many other presidents besides Barack Obama has been president of the United States? I want you to count. It's not very hard to count, is it? So citing an exception is not working. How many women, count, I want you to count how many women, get your calculators out and calculate how many women have been president of the United States. Crickets, right? So that shows you right there that citing one exception is not a resolution to racism. Same thing as I have a black friend or I have a Latina friend. She's the CEO of the company, okay? That's an exception. But systematically, we know that people of color have been pushed out of these positions through systems and policies and people's own personal prejudices. My professor is black and still got tenure. I can say that for, I can speak, speak on that one myself. I'm the first African-American in the history of my department to even earn tenure, to go through that process. Up until the end, the tenure committee has been, been a, a, a white enterprise. And it's not to say that whiteness is bad or European Americans is ba are bad, but it's not very diverse. And people like me are bowed, barred out of the process. Examples of public figures of minoritized groups who have made it are usually pointed to. Giving personal anecdotes. My friend, she worked really hard and three other people got a scholarship over her because they're black. And usually that's people's assumptions. They don't know the whole story. And the idea is that they're there not because they're qualified. That's a type of racism anyway. Assuming that black folks are... They're not because they're qualified, but that's because they're black. And if they weren't black, they wouldn't have got in. Got in. That's an assumption that these folks didn't have what it takes. So the personal example, I know someone who is a person of color and I have no problem with them. We're still only hearing the dominant person's limited perception and limited to individualistic perspective and not structural, institutional, and or societal perspective. So what I want you to keep doing is not look at your own personal situation. But look at society, look at history, look at institutions, how they oppress people because of race, class, and gender. Then you can understand systemic racism, systemic sexism, systemic classism. Okay, but the patterns of oppression are consistent and well-documented. Arguing that oppression is just human nature. Injustice exists in every society. It's just human nature. This is what people say. Somebody has to be on top. That is a justification for the isms. We have to do better than that. So this video is interesting. I like this video because it causes us to look at group stereotypes. So I will have a space on there that you can comment, view it, and then comment on Canvas. Appealing to a universalized humanity. Why can't we all just be humans? This is another common misconception. A, a common rebuttal. A yeah, but common rebuttal. We all believe red is focusing on the difference that divides us. People say that often. I hear that in churches a lot. But it ignores the challenges of police brutality. It ignores the stereotypes that all black folks are poor and lazy and, and not intelligent. It doesn't really address the real issues. Unemployment, discrimination in housing. So it's easy for the dominant race to say that because they're not discriminated against in terms of by race, but everyday African Americans are discriminated against. So I'm all about unity. You know, my worldview, I, I have a bias as I teach. I come from a Christian perspective. That's my bias. And my perspective talks really from a scriptural standpoint, talks about love and unity. You know, that's that's what Christianity teaches. That's what it's all about. It's, it may not be practiced in that way. People use it for oppression as a tool of oppression and slavery, but the intent of it 
is the, the premise of it is about love and togetherness and unity in God. And so my whole desire is that the races come together, that we all integrate. But it has to be done the right way. We can't just ignore racism and say, if we stop talking about it, it'll go away. And when people bring it up, they're just causing trouble and dividing us. That's a really cowardice way of addressing it. We have to do the heavy lifting and do the real work. And I love this this fingerprint here. We all have the same fingerprint. So we're all, we're all the same, but we have our differences. And we can still celebrate that. Immunity from socialization and ignoring intersectionality. So a person can think they are, aren't affected by socialization, but we're all affected by socialization, but can become so used to seeing it, so, so used to uh, the society that we live in that we don't even recognize it. It affects us whether we, we want to or not, whether we want it to or not. It's the air that we breathe. It's like a fish in water. They don't know that they're in water. They just swim. That's their existence. That's how socialization is. We're socialized by television, by our religious institutions, by our parents' teaching, and the media influences us. Advertising, we say, well, that advertising doesn't influence me. Yes, it does. It influences the way you dress. You wear a certain type of jeans. You wear a certain type of tights or, or, or women's clothing that everybody else wears. Where, where in 20 years ago, it would not be socially accepted. So you are influenced by popular culture and media. Everything that we do, even the trend of carrying a cup of Starbucks around is, is trendy, and we were influenced by seeing somebody else do that. So we can't say that if I stop, I, I, I can control my actions in terms of being influenced. You, you really, you can, but the, social, the pressures of socialization are very strong. The forces of socialization are very strong. Intersectionality, now remember that word, it's the two different positionalities in life, two or three, like being a woman and being European American. And so they kind of influence each other. So you can be oppressed as a woman, but you can be privileged as a European American person. And they don't cancel out each other. So for example, an African American woman is going to have a different experience and is going to many times struggle more in terms of isms and oppression many times unless it's a person like oprah but she still has to experience racism she talks about that all the time even as oprah winfrey but a black woman or a woman of color latina latina is going to have a different experience maybe a tougher time than a european american woman that's middle class a poor black woman is going to be going to struggle an oppressed person will often not recognize that they're in a privileged group as well as oppressed groups an example is a poor white man who sees that he's experiencing race classism. He may not see that he still has privilege because he's a white male. Not seeing structural and institutional power. Not seeing structural and institutional power. Dominant groups will pass on their behavioral patterns to their children. You see that a lot. I watch a show called Master Chef Junior, and you can see the children are from upper class, even the way they talk. The way they respond back to the adult judges, they call them by a first name basis instead of saying Mr. Gordon, pa Gordon Powell, Cow, I forgot Gordon's last name, Gordon, I can't remember, this is a famous chef. They call them by their first names. On the other hand, minoritized groups will pass on their own behavioral patterns. So, it, so both groups pass on, not on the other hand, I think I missed, well, all I'm trying to say here is both groups pass on their behavioral patterns. Excuses are often made by companies for lack of diversity in the workplace, but they're not willing to make a sacrifice, spend money, get out of their comfort zone to make it more diverse. This is another section, the politics or language. I'll just say a little bit here. Language can often take on a negative connotation that influences people's view when they hear certain words. So the example that they give in the text, a bum is used by, by some to refer to the homeless. And it has a negative connotation. So sometimes we have to change our language because politics, words like colored is politically charged because it has a particular social historical moment that was ugly. And so a colored person is outdated. We say people of color. I know that's confusing, but people of color today is more socially accepted than a colored person because it has so much negativity attached to it. Just like we don't say Negro anymore, really. We say 
African American or black. So words have meaning. And here I talk about homelessness is a, a social ill, but often we assume that a person that's homeless is lazy, a drug addict, and they lack ambition, so we call them a bum. It has a negative connotation. Moving on here, invalidating claims of oppression as oversensitivity. This is a very popular one in reaction to a class like this and readings like this. They say people can't take a joke anymore as they say something hurtful. When persons from a minoritized group speaks of oppression, they are shut down by the majority as taking things too seriously. They're complaining they want special rights. I haven't been affected by prejudice. That's what a person says from the, from the, minor, from the majority group. Of course, because they have privilege. And in the case of European American, they have white privilege. So, of course, you're not going to experience what it's like to be a person of color. And that's okay. Thankfully, you don't have to experience that. But, so, but try to be more sympathetic and understand of somebody that is going through it and not look at it through your lens because you don't understand, really, unless you sit and talk to somebody. Most often, the dominant group mindset is that if they don't didn't mean to oppress, to be oppressive, then they weren't. And that, that's just not the case. Sometimes you can have unintentional bias. This behavior takes the problem away from the dominant group. It's pushed on to the minoritized group. And so in this way, generally, racism is thought of as a, as a problem of a black person, the problem of a Latino or Latina person. They have to deal with racism. It's not really the, 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 the prerogative of the European American because they don't experience racism, so it is not their thing. All of the burden is put on black and brown folks. That is why we begin to have whiteness studies because whiteness studies says for so long, when we talk about racism, it comes from the perspective of black and brown folks or the, the focal point and the onus and the heavy lifting is done by the black and brown folks. And the only race is thought of as black or brown or person of color. But whiteness is a race, too. And that makes people uncomfortable because we're not used to talking about it. That's what whiteness studies is all about. Coming from the perspective, looking at, okay, what can the oppressor do? What can the dominant group do to make a difference and not put all the, the, the burden on, on black folks? Raising that if choice is involved, again, we're still, we're looking at, Common rebuttals, that if choice is involved, it can't be oppression. The illusion of individuality and originality in the U.S., so the illusion of personal choice, that my, my, if I make a choice not to be a racist, then it doesn't exist. But that's not looking at it from a global perspective. Often our worldview and biases are shaped by outside forces and we do not even realize it. The topic of choice is only valid when it supports the majority. And so when, it, when, it, when minorities make a choice, then it's not valid. Positioning social justice education as something extra, not taking it serious. Like people will often say, we don't have enough time. We barely have enough time to do the real subjects like math and science or math and language arts. And so... We don't have time to talk about diversity. Well, that's a misunderstanding because you're supposed to integrate these things into the community, into the curriculum. These things are supposed to be, in, they don't replace curriculum. They are integrated into the curriculum. And so in this way, if I am trying to teach a math class, perhaps I can practice equality or equity and bring in some of the young ladies who, who systematically are often pushed out of, of doing the upper level math classes and get push more women into the STEM field. Or when we're talking about his American history, when we're talking about colonial days, look at the role of Native Americans in that at that time period. Look at the role of Native Americans in the Revolutionary War. That's being more inclusive and trying to get not, and we're not just forcing it, but we're gonna try to get a more full picture of history. And people think it takes away time, but that's that's a misnomer. That's rhetoric. It's false. It's fake news. <laughs> uh, being parallels, par being parallels by guilt. Excuse me, I can't talk today. Being paralyzed by guilt. While it is normal to have these feelings when understanding oppression, it is important to move beyond them. 
Lack of action due to guilt keeps oppression in place. A lot of people say, I don't know what to do. I feel so guilty. But we must move forward and figure out what we need to do. What's our part?